Welcome to all of you who are here and welcome to our international audience. It's good to see everybody here today. Let's turn off our cell phones, uh, which I sometimes even forget to do. Put it on vibrate or something so, so you can hear it, nobody else can. Um, I've got a few announcements and then we're gonna have a sermonette today from, from uh, the Dean of Students of Ambassador Christian College. Uh, let's ask God's blessing and we'll get right into our, our service today. Father, we thank you for each one who's here, who's watching by internet. Bless each one of us and bless our new college year, Father. Bless all the students who's coming. Anoint them with understanding so that they can apply what they're going to be hearing. We ask your blessing and inspiration on the message today, both messages. In Jesus' name we pray and we believe we receive. Amen. My, uh, my, the title of my message today is going to be Faith for the Tribulation. In other words, it's going to take faith to get through it. Before I get into that, before we introduce Dr. Souls, um, or present to him, you already know him. I've got just a few announcements. This came out just this week from Israel. Now, I've been telling people for many years they're going to rebuild the temple. I've had different ones I've run into and said, oh, they're never going to do that again. But I've been saying, yes, they will. Since the Six Day War in 1967, those who remember that period of time remember that uh, when they got the, the, uh, the temple mount, that the Jews were talking about it, and they've been talking about it ever since. And all the years of this college, I've been telling our students they're preparing, they're getting ready to build the temple. Now, I'm not saying that anymore. They made an announcement, they are now ready. They haven't started yet, but they're now ready. All, and they said, I think it was uh, Hillel Weiss, I believe, the speaker for the Sanhedrin, he said, the only thing now is we're waiting for the Israeli government to go ahead and let us do it. All right, this came out just Wednesday. Um, or, or maybe it came out Monday and I didn't print it till Wednesday. I think it came out Monday. Uh, this is from Israel News. Uh, the title is Sanhedrin Petitions to Government to Blow the Shofar on the Temple Mount for the First Time Since the, the Destruction of the Temple. Now, that happened in the generation of the apostles. That's what happened then. The, the, the temple was destroyed in AD 70. And they have not blown the shofar on the Temple Mount since then. A petition is currently being considered by, by the Prime Minister, which, if accepted, will permit a Jew to blow the shofar on Rosh Hashanah. That's the Feast of Trumpets, which is coming up on the 19th of September. They see the new moon um, in Jerusalem the night before. That means that the Feast of Trumpets, which is the fourth holy day of the year, um, and is the first day of the seventh month on the biblical calendar, it's a day that pictures the second coming of Christ. They'll be blowing the shofar possibly on that day. That's what they call Rosh Hashanah. The Bible calls it trumpets. It will mark the first time since the destruction of the temple that a Jew will be permitted to perform this powerful act on the holiest site in the world. According to Jewish law, I'm quoting now, it is forbidden to blow the shofar on the Sabbath except for the temple, for on the temple mount. If they succeed, this will be the first time a shofar will be blown in the temple mount, on the Temple Mount since the destruction of the temple 1950 years ago. Rabbi Hillel Weiss, he's the spokesman for the new, newly formed Sanhedrin that just got formed back in 2004. They officially began in January of 2005. He emphasized that on Rosh Hashanah, the world is judged. Now that sounds like he's been reading Revelation, and these people are not Christians. Because for those of you who have been here year after year when we've had a service on the Feast of Trumpets, I've explained that this day pictures the seven trumpets of Revelation, <clears throat> which is God's judgment during the great and terrible day of the Lord. It's God's judgment on the world. And I don't know where you get I don't know where you can get that in the Old Testament. You gotta use the New Testament for that. And yet this rabbi said it pictures the world being judged. He's absolutely right. He said um, he wants to quote call out to the King of Kings with the eternal voice of the shofar to spread his kingdom to every creature. Sounds like he's been reading Revelation. He, he, he's expecting the king of kings to come here and set up a, a kingdom to rule over every creature. And yet he's, he's Orthodox Jew, go figure. Uh, also, he mentions the manifesting the universal desire for redemption. Well, who's our redeemer? We are destined to do again in the end of days when the dead will be resurrected, the day of universal and true freedom. A lot of Jews don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. So I think Rabbi Hillel Weiss has been reading the book of Revelation. Now they have 70 nations that are working together with them 
Uh, every leader, it says, in the world who cares and who sees himself as representative of one of those 70 nations should call on Prime Minister Netanyahu to permit this to take place. And then finally it says, no one is speaking about the true owner of the land, says this rabbi, and his kingship. The true owner of the land is not Israel. It's the king of kings. He's got that right. I just thought I'd share that with you. Any, uh, any questions or comments? So I'm not saying they're going to build the temple this year or next year. I don't know. It may be four or five years before they even start building. Uh, but next week I've got something else I want to share you share with you about the completion of the 6,000 years, unless God changes my message. Uh, I've got something I want to share with you on that. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, present to you the Dean of Students of Ambassador Christian College. I forget what year he graduated with his doctorate in theology. He was in one of the first classes, second or third class, wasn't he? His first doctoral class was 13. Yeah, but when did he first come? When, the first day, he didn't come in the first day A class. No, he got his associate was it the second, second year. Yeah, I think he came in the second year, yeah. So he's been with us a long, long time. And um, do pray for our students who are coming. We're starting this Monday night, 7 o'clock sharp, for those of you who and by the way, Craig Poplin's going to be a student here. Glad you made it, Dave. You're certainly welcome. We appreciate you being here. And so we're going to have, because of the COVID virus, it may be a very small turnout this year, but still, we're going to be having class uh, this Monday night. So do pray for our students, please. Um, any other announcements that I have forgotten? Anybody think of anything? Everybody staying healthy? Yes. Good, good, good. That's great. All right, without further ado, I want to present to you for a sermon today the, uh, the Dean of Students at Ambassador Christian College, which, by the way, I hope you'll be here Monday night to introduce yourself, or Tuesday night if you can, if you yes. can, yes. Dr. Stephen Sultz. Hey, Amen. Thank you, Dr. Slough. Thank you, Dr. Slough. And um, be before I get started or say anything, um, I, I want to uh, I want to thank Dr. Slough for his his leadership and for the word he's been bringing. Um, I, I've been following along at home um, the last few weeks or last few months, um, but Dr. Slough never never lets us down when it comes to what he's bringing us. Um, a, a, a word that is right now on time. Right. It's, it's an on time word right now because it's it's not it's not it's it's it, it's make it, it puts the world together with the word because we know the word the world has to line up with the world at some point. So Dr. Slav, I just wanted to say that publicly that um, you've continued to, to, to bless my spirit um, with this Bible study and with this ministry. And I just wanted to, to just to say that um, out loud. Um, because you know we should acknowledge the prophet um, when we get that opportunity. Um, so just wanted to say that uh, welcome to all. Uh, it's been a while since I've been before you, um, but I thank God that He has uh, kept us and kept you uh, through what we've been going through. It uh, it has been a a, a rocky road, um, but at the end of the day, we know God is still in charge and God is still going to lead and protect us. Um, like he says in his word. Um, I don't really have a, uh, I really came this morning to really just encourage, um, if I can, uh, through the word. Um, so if you would, just turn with me to Psalms 27. Psalms 27. I just want to pull out a, a, a few scriptures uh, this morning as we, uh, as, as we begin, uh, as we begin a new day, as we begin a new Sabbath, as we rest ourselves um, from a week's labor um, and through all that you've been through this week um, I don't know but God knows God knows exactly what you've been through happy sad good or bad and um, we just ask that you just lay it um, lay it at his footstool so that he can man so he can minister to it and minister to you uh, Psalm 27 we're going to start it in verse 8. Verse 8 says, When thou said, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not thy face far from me. Verse 9, Put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. 
Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. Verse 10, when my, my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Verse 11, teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. And then as we get to verse 14, it, it simply says, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. We're in a waiting time. We're, 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 you know, you, you can't be in a rush to do too much these days. You know, the, 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 the drive through doesn't go as fast as it used to. The, 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 the entry into the grocery store just isn't, isn't the same anymore, you know? But, how, but, but we have to learn to wait, to wait. And not only physically here, but we also have to learn to wait spiritually on the Lord because we want to make sure, well, God wants to make sure that we're in line for what he has for us. So I would want to say wait. Wait on the Lord. Verse 14. Psalm 27 and verse 14. Turn over a couple pages. Uh, well, turn over just one page, actually, to uh, Psalm 31. Psalm 31. Waiting is our greatest show of faith. Yes. 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 Amen to that. The comment was made that waiting is our greatest show of faith. And I so agree with that. And that's one thing God has taught me through my walk is patience. You know, sometimes God can just sit you down and just say, hey, look, I'm in control. And let's not forget that. No matter how you're feeling, no matter what you're going through, God will do that to you sometimes. And that's to truly let you know that he loves you. Because we can always go too fast, but sometimes it can lead us where we don't want to be. And that's in his favor. So Psalm 31, Psalm 31, I want to start in, in verse 21. Blessed be the Lord, for he has shown me his marvelous kindness in a strong city. For I said in haste, I am cut off from before thine eyes. Nevertheless, thou hear the voice of my supplications when I cried unto thee. Nevertheless, he has heard the voice of my supplications when I cried unto he, unto thee. Verse 23, O oh, love the Lord, all ye his saints, for the Lord preserves the faithful and plentiful rewardeth the proud doer. But I wanted to bring emphasis to verse 24. Verse 24 says, Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, all ye that hope in the Lord. So now, so, so now that we have a, a sense of patience and a sense of, of, of waiting on the Lord, we can now be of good courage because now we have shifted whatever going on in our lives and whatever we're dealing with, we're shifting it on the Lord. Now we're waiting. But in that wait, I can be of good courage. I can be of great courage, you know, because I just cast that, whatever was what I'm, I'm dealing with, at his feet at his feet, not for me to manage anymore because I can't, I can't do it. I can only go so far and then that's when we need divine intervention. That's when we need our savior to come and make his word true in our lives. And I know he will, and I know he will. Let's flip over a few more pages. I wanna to go to the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter three. And I want you to start at verse 6. And all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. He shall direct thy path. I just wanted to pull out that verse, the verse before it. I should have read it with, with, with it as well. Verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. So now we're waiting, we're encouraged, and now we're trusting. Now we're trusting. Our, our encouragement has built up our trust, which is building up our faith. And now we're, 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 we're being built up, you know. One reason why we come to Sabbath service is to get built up, to get built up, to hear a perspective, to hear a word from the Lord 
so that our souls can benefit and that we can go out and share that with others. So in all thy ways, we want to acknowledge him and he shall direct our paths. Uh, I'm going to go back uh, as, I, as I sum up here. I'm going to go back in the Psalms. I'm going to go to Psalm 34. Psalm 34, and I will take my seat. <clears throat> Psalm 34, I want to start in verse 4. Verse 4 says, I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from all of my fears. He delivered me from all of my fears. Verse 7, the Lord, the angel of the Lord encamped around me, around about them that fear him, and delivered them. Verse 8, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord. So what we've done is we, we, we've waited, we, we, we've built our patience, we've built our confidence, and now we have come to where we have full trust in the Lord. Full trust in the Lord. So, that, so I, I want to leave you with those words. Let it build in you. Let it build in you. Lay it at his feet. Continue to be encouraged and fully trust in the Lord. For he is your savior. And he will do what you need done in your life according to his will for your life. Amen? Amen. Be blessed. Uh, I am grateful once again to be in front of you. Um, to our listening audience, we, we thank God for your presence today. Uh, morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you may be. And uh, we, we pray that you stay encouraged by these messages and this Bible study and, and stay connected to the ministry as well as to the Ambassador Christian College. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you. I appreciate that. In fact, that was a word in season because uh, of all the, the waiting we have to do in line at Starbucks and other places. So that's a very, that's a word in due season. The Pew Research Center did a survey. Only 30% of all Americans attend church weekly, as, and that was as of 2013. Only 37%. A little more than one out of three attend regularly. Oh, that's weekly. 92% <coughs> of Americans own a Bible, but only about a third of Americans go to church. Of those who own a Bible, according to the surveys, and they did this anonymously, only 12% read the Bible daily. 88% of Americans read the Bible occasionally. Now, pilots know that you have to know what's in that pilot operating handbook. Before you get in that airplane, you better know what your airspeeds are or you're going to crash and you're going to die. you got to know what's in that book. That operating handbook tells you how to operate that specific airplane. Here is a book that tells you how to operate your life. And yet most people are not reading God's instruction manual. Now, for those of you who have gone through the college, you've heard me give these statistics during orientation. But I want to give these to you. I haven't done this in, in, in church before. But 81% of Americans believe that Benjamin Franklin's quotation, where God helps those who help themselves, 81% of all Americans think that's in the Bible. That tells you that 81% of Americans aren't reading the Bible, or they know better than that. Some years ago, I was sitting on my front, my grandmother's front porch, I was a kid, and Grandma said, you know, we're in the last days now. How do, how do you know? Well, because the Bible says that in the last days, you won't be able to tell winter from summer except by the budding of the trees. Really? You're a kid, you believe everything Grandma tells you. Now, we all have grandmas. We've had them, and we love them, and I wouldn't dare speak against anybody's grandma, not even my own. So, you know, Grandma tells you it's true. So I went home and told my daddy. Now, my daddy didn't know much about church, but he'd read the Bible through three times. And I said, guess what, Daddy? Grandma said we must be in the last days because you can't tell winter from summer except by the budding of the trees. He looked at me, and I've never forgotten. He got angry. He said, that's not in the Bible. <laughs> Just like that. I never forgot that. Maybe it's because of his emotions. And I remember that event so well. I said, it's, but Grandma said it was. He said, no. He said, I've read the Bible through three times. I'm telling you, it's not there. If a person would just read the Bible, they would know a lot of these things are not in the Bible that people say are in there. Well, you say, but Americans don't go to church. I mean, two-thirds of them don't go to church. So what's surprising that 81% of Americans think that's in the Bible? Then they did a study of just 
evangelical, church-going, born-again Christians, people who claim to be born again. And the survey, they surveyed them, and 80% of them thought that quote was in the Bible. So of all those who claim to be born-again Christians, 80% are not studying the Bible and are, are hardly even reading it. Boy, no wonder we've got such deception in the last days. So when the Antichrist comes and says, hey, this is a good deal, take this mark, we get it in your hand, and um, you can go up to the cash register, you just lay your hand on the scanner, don't have to carry cash anymore, nobody's gonna hit you over the head. Isn't that a wonderful system? Nobody's gonna knock you down, take your money from you. Isn't that wonderful? Don't have to carry a credit card anymore. Won't that be great? And people are so deceived, they'll say, well, yeah. There'll be a few Christians who'll say, no, no, don't do that. The Bible says don't take that mark. Oh, that's, that old Bible, you can't believe anything that says. And even 80% of born-again Christians are not reading the Bible. Now, last week, I talked about speaking out your faith. And today, I want to piggyback on what I talked about last week. I'm going to add some more to it because what I talked about was so important. For those of you who, who didn't hear that, go back. It's uh, archived. Is it on Facebook? Is that how they find it? Facebook, yeah. Last week. It's not on YouTube yet, but you can find it on Facebook. Be sure to hear that because it's going to tell you how to get through the tribulation. And today I want to add to that. Now, my scripture that I'm going to give you is Hebrews 13. Before I turn there, though, and read it to you, I want to mention that we were told last week, we read through the scripture in Isaiah 59, verse 21. I'm giving you the references, and you can write them down. Where, where God said, I put my words in your mouth. Now, the reason they're in your mouth is because you're talking to them. God expects you to speak his words. And then Ephesians 5.1 says, Be followers of God as dear children. The word follower is not the best translation. The Greek literally says, Be imitators of God. Well, how do I imitate God? I've never seen God physically. I don't know how he combs his hair. I don't know how he walks. How am I going to imitate God? I imitate what he says. That's the only way to imitate God. And so we're supposed to speak what God says. Now, Hebrews 13, verse 5 let your conversation, the Greek word there is conduct, be without covetousness. Don't live a life of covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he has said, verse 6, so that we may boldly say. Whatever it was God said, he said it so we could say it. Do you see that? I didn't mention this last week. God said something in the Bible so that we can say. We're supposed to imitate God and say what God says. You've heard me tell the story over and over and over, and I won't bore you by telling you one more time, except to just remind you that when I was healed of asthma, I read 1 Peter 2, 24, and I spoke it out. I am healed right now. God said, are you? I didn't hear him say that, but you know, it's like he was looking down and saying, are you? Are you healed? Yes, sir, I'm healed. Are you sure you're healed? Yeah, I'm sure I'm healed. Okay, you're healed. In other words, Jesus said you can have what you say. Mark 11:23. 23, you can have what you say. Now, let me read it again. 13, 5 and 6. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. For he has said, verse 6, so that we may say and say it boldly. Whatever God said, do you believe on Christ? You've repented of your sins. You can say, I'm saved. You can say it, I'm saved. If you've accepted, you know, remember Romans 8 9 says you must have his spirit or you don't belong to him. But if you've received, if you've been baptized, had hands laid on you, you received the Holy Spirit, you've done everything, you've crossed your T's, you've dotted your I's, you know that you're saved. You can tell people, I am saved. Some of the cults out there say, oh, don't ever say you're saved. No, no, I am saved. Thank you very much. Now let me read that whole verse. <clears throat> For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I won't fear what man shall do to me. See, that's not quoting necessarily verse 5, but based on verse 5, you now can boldly say, okay, well then, if he won't leave me or forsake me, then he's my helper, and I'm not going to be afraid of what men will do to me. Just not going to worry about it. Uh, Deuteronomy 31, I'm going to go through these scriptures pretty quickly. Deuteronomy 31, got a number of Old Testament scriptures to give you on this, but Jesus said live by every word of God. So let's live by this. Deuteronomy 31 and verse, <clears throat> verses 6 and 8. <clears throat> 31, 6. 
Be strong and of a good courage. Now, this is where Paul got this scripture from. So I want to show you. And he paraphrased it. And you can too. Be strong and of a good courage. That goes right along with our sermon of today. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he is that, go, that does go with you. He will not fail you, nor forsake you. Paul said, since he said that, I can boldly say, God is my helper. God is going to take care of me. You can boldly say that. Because if he's not going to leave you, it's kind of like if you're out swimming and there's a, a, a lifeguard standing just a few feet away on the bank and you're out there swimming, and if you have a problem, you can call him. He's right there with you. Now, if the lifeguard says, hey, I'm going to run down to the store. I'll be back in about 30 minutes. You better get out of the water. You don't have to swim. But as long as he's with you, you don't have to be afraid. And that's how it is. Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now, verse 8 says, and the Lord, he it is that does go before you. He will be with you. He will not fail you, neither forsake you. Therefore, fear not neither be dismayed. Don't fear. What about the COVID virus? God is with me. He's not going to forsake me. Therefore, he's my helper. Why don't you, why don't you just say, hey, I'm not going to get this disease. I've asked God to protect me. Now, I'm doing my part. I'm taking my vitamins, drinking my green tea every day. It's good for your immune system. Uh, but you can still say, I'm not going to get this disease. And mean it. You can boldly say, because Christ is with me. Fear not, nor be afraid. Uh, I want to go to uh, Psalm 118 and verse 6. If you're taking notes, I'm giving you the references. If you, if you want to turn to it, feel free to turn to it. But also, I want you to, you can write these down, make a good Bible study for this afternoon. 118 verse 6. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? That's just one verse. If God is on my side, what can man do? That reminds me of Romans 8, 31, where he says, if God be for us, who can be against us? Now, you've already heard Psalm 27 today in the sermonette, but guess what? <laughs> You're going to get to hear it again. Psalm 27, verse 1, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? But now you have to remember, Jesus said, what you say comes to pass. We need to be saying what God said. He has said so that we may boldly say. He said something so we can say it. What are we to, to say? Well, let's see. God said such and such. Therefore, I can say, I'll never get a job. I can't make ends meet. I'm probably going to starve to death. Wait a minute. Where did he say that? God has said so that I can say, I'm probably going to get this virus and die next week. People have died in, within a week. Don't say that. What did God say? Psalm 103, verse 3, he heals all your diseases. Even if you get it, he's going to heal you. And you can say, God is healing me. By his stripes I was healed. Start saying what God said. What's this got to do with the tribulation? When the great tribulation comes, how are you going to get through it? And even before the great tribulation, we're already having some affliction now, aren't we? Remember in Mark 13 where it says there will be affliction such as was not from the beginning. Matthew says tribulation, but in the Greek it's the same word. The word affliction is the same word as tribulation. We're going to go through tribulation or affliction even before the great tribulation comes. How will you get through it? People are afraid of things that don't even ever happen to begin with. Exactly. A lot of, a lot of the things we're afraid of never happen. Now, Jesus said, I'm going to turn to 1 Samuel. This is a strange place to go. But 1 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 19. You might say, wait, you're way back in 1 Samuel. Jesus said, if you believe that what you say comes to pass, you can tell a mountain to move and it'll move. Joshua believed that what he said would come to pass, and he told the sun to stand still. How about that? 1 Samuel 3, 19. Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and did let none of his words fall to the ground. Whatever he said came to pass. You know why? Samuel was a prophet. He believed what he said would come to pass. Chapter 9 of 1 Samuel. In verse 6. <clears throat> Remember Saul was out looking for the, <clears throat> the donkeys. And he said unto him, Behold, now there is in the city a man of God. And he's, he's an honorable man. <clears throat> All that he says comes 
surely the pass. Let us go there for, for, for adventure. Perhaps he can show us the way we should go. Everything he says comes to pass. Is that the way it is with you? Now, Jesus said, if you believe something and then you speak it, it will come to pass. He said, whatsoever you say, good or bad. Remember 2 Corinthians 4, I think I read that a week or two weeks ago. We believe, therefore we speak. That's what, that's what most people do. They really believe they're going to get cancer, and they speak it. Well, why do you believe that? Well, everybody in my family, well, maybe you'll be the exception. Why don't you believe God? Well, everybody in my family dies by the time they're 60. Well, you don't have to die when you're 60. You don't have to. Or whatever it might be. Now, I want to go to uh, another scripture here in the Old Testament, Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah 23 and verse 28. The prophet that has a dream, if he's a real prophet of God, let him tell the dream. He that has my word, I'm looking at all of you out there. You've got God's word. You've got it. You've got it. All of you got a Bible today. Everybody here has got a Bible today, all the way to the back of the room back there. Well, he that has my word, and you've got it, let him speak your words no, let him speak my word. Don't speak your words. Speak God's word and do it faithfully. Watch the chaff, your words, to the wheat, God's words. Do you listen to how Christians talk? Well, you know, I just, I'm just so worried. I'm just so afraid. I have so much fear. I better not do this. This might happen. I better not do it. There are a lot of preachers that won't get up and preach the Bible because they're afraid that they're people are going to leave and the fact of the matter is a lot of them do or they're afraid they'll get kicked out and that happens too but why not just be bold and trust God I mean all of you know what I teach and yet you came today you may not be back next week but you came today <laughs> Ch chapter 23 verse 28 if you've got my word what are you supposed to do speak my word let him that has my word speak my word this is what we're not supposed to just read it we're supposed to speak it jeremiah 23 verse 28 jesus said i'll never leave you nor forsake you now you can speak that what is in your heart jesus said it now you listen to me very carefully now he said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, and you bring things to pass. What's abundantly in your heart? Abundantly. Is it uh, soap operas and uh, game shows? Is that abundantly in your heart? Or some novel or some, you know, the Hallmark romance Christmas shows or whatever they're doing? What is abundantly in your heart? Because if you speak out of the abundance of your heart, watch out. Now, true story. You know, they got these black boxes on airplanes. When they crash, the, the airplane can explode and burn up, but that black box is indestructible. They've had to go down way down to the depths of the ocean to get that black box. And what it is, it records everything that was said in the, in the cockpit of that big Boeing jet so they can know what was going on and they might get a clue as to why the plane crashed you know maybe the co-pilot and the pilot are talking and oh look at this this is wrong that's wrong or whatever and then the plane crashes now they got an idea one of the um, airplanes that crashed after they got it out of the ocean or wherever they were listening to what the pilot was saying he realized something was wrong i forget what it was but the last words he said before the plane crashed he was taking god's name in vain he died taking God's name in vain. Do you know why he did that? He wasn't thinking, now they're going to hear this later on, maybe I better be nice. No, he spoke out of his heart. A lot of the stuff we say, we prepare it in advance. Like right now, I'm not speaking out of my heart, I'm speaking out of my notes here, and out of my mind. But if, if uh, you're driving down the road and you got your mind on something else and all of a sudden you see the blue light come on, you might say something and didn't even expect to say it right in front of your pastor or your <laughs> or whatever. 
I mean, you could have Billy Graham in the front seat, and all of a sudden you get scared and you'll speak right out of your heart. Something you didn't prepare to say. I was thinking you were going to say he was praying for all the souls on the plane before the crash. <laughs> yeah, if he'd have thought about it, if he'd have thought about it, but instead he just hollered out what was in his, his heart. And, he, and cursing was in his heart. Some years ago, I was I was uh, moving from Texas where I'd lived for quite a number of years. And I was moving back to North Carolina and I had that car packed all the way up to the ceiling. And it was a hot day in Mississippi. That's where I was on Interstate 20. It was the 30th of June. Now, now get that in mind, way down in South Mississippi and it's hot down there. I'm, I'm driving, of course I had the air conditioning on, but for some reason my air conditioner decided not to work anymore on that very hot day. So I had to roll the windows down. Now my car is packed. Well, I noticed, I heard a noise back there and I looked back there, I'm driving on the interstate and that bag was just about to blow out that back window because I had to roll it down. So I should have pulled over on the side of the road but instead I said, well, nothing, you know, I'm on the interstate, not that much traffic. So I went back there and I'm rolling down that window, rolling it up so that the bag won't blow up, won't blow out of the car. And I looked ahead and there was a great big curve, which I didn't know and I overcorrected for the curve and turned the car over. I went right into the medium. If it was a typical medium, I wouldn't have had any problems. This was a sharp incline and the car rolled. I counted five times. Now, when that happened, I didn't know if I was gonna die or not. The actual thought came to me, you may crash and die. That car could explode. Well, anything could happen. And you know, we're told in John 16, 23, in that day after his resurrection, you shall Ask me nothing. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, he'll, he'll give you. I didn't have time to, to say, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I didn't have time for that. You know what came out of my heart? Jesus! Boom! Like that, landed right on my wheels. Didn't get, didn't bleed. The windshield burst into a thousand pieces and went 30 feet from me. That's where they found my glasses 30 feet away. I didn't get scratched. Had you been riding the car, you would have been killed. Because in the passenger seat, when I turned that car over, the, the, the roof was caved in in the passenger seat. In the back seat, the roof was caved in. There was only one place where it wasn't caved in, right over my head. What, wasn't that better than taking God's name in vain? What is abundantly in your heart? What just comes out of your heart in a moment of crisis? Is it cursing or is it Jesus? What's in your heart? The only way that Jesus is going to come out of your heart, out of your mouth, is if, he, if you put him in your heart. Now, I'm not trying to sound religious or trying to sound sentimental. A lot of people get turned off. They think, oh, you're being sentimental. Uh-uh. Listen, let me tell you something. When you get married, you want that person to love you, not just with their mind. Am I right, guys? With their heart. Do any of you husbands disagree with that? None of you disagree. All right, how about you wives? Do you, do you want your husband to love you with his heart? Okay, you understand? So the Bible gives the analogy that the church is like a bride, and Jesus wants us to love him. He's told us this in Matthew 22. Love God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, all your strength, everybody, everything about you. Love him with your arms and your feet and your legs and your head and your mind and your heart. Love him totally. And if you have him abundantly in your heart, when you're in a crisis situation, you won't even think. See, I wasn't supposed to pray to Jesus. I was supposed to pray to the Father. <laughs> I just hollered. I didn't have time. I'm rolling, 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 rolling. God took care of me. Now, he allowed the accident to occur, but I didn't bleed. I didn't have a broken bone. I had a few little nicks here, and that's all I had. I had a whiplash, but outside of that, I was fine. So what was the lesson? The lesson was that even though God allows you to go through affliction, he's still there with you. And he will protect you in affliction. Affliction is coming on this nation. Tribulation is coming on the world. But God's going to be with us. You may go to him and feel good right there. Yeah. yeah. And I didn't. But that was before anybody had a cell phone. And ten minutes later, here comes a wrecker by, without having to call him. Took my car and didn't charge me anything. Kept my car as a piece of junk. I mean, I everything worked out fine. Everything worked out great. God was there. I mean, 10 minutes later, here comes a wrecker. Sees the accident. I think there was another lesson, too. What's that? Don't lean back. Don't lean back and roll the window. 90 miles an hour, like I 
I was only going, I was going 65 to 70 somewhere right yeah. now. But that was enough. But yeah, uh, or another lesson, buy a car that's got the electronic windows. <laughs> electric windows, whatever. Not electronic, but electric windows. So <clears throat> learn, learn something from that. Now, let me, while I'm in Jeremiah, I want to go to chapter 44 and verse 28. Jeremiah 44, 28, yet a small number that escaped, the sword shall return out of the land of Egypt into the land of Judah. And in other words, God says, this is what's going to happen. I'm speaking it. And all the remnant of Judah that are gone into the land of Egypt shall sojourn there. And they will know whose words shall stand, mine or theirs. God's word is going to stand. So don't speak your words. Oh, I'll never get over this. I'll probably die. I'll probably... You know, I'm a failure. I'll never get anything to work for me. Ah, uh -uh. God's words will stand. Start speaking his words out of your mouth. While I'm in Jeremiah, I'm going to go back to chapter 1 and verse, verses 11 and 12. Jeremiah 1, verses 11 and 12. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. What do you see? He said, I see a rod of an almond tree. Then said the Lord, you have well seen. That rod represent, represent apparently authority. He said, for I will hasten my word to perform it. God will not necessarily perform your words, and thank God he doesn't, but he will perform his words. Because you say, I'll probably die, I'll probably get sick, this will happen, that will happen, uh, you know, my house will probably go into foreclosure. All these horrible things, don't say those things. God said, I'll hasten my word to perform it. Why don't you put God's word in your mouth? If, if you're doing what the Philippians did, they were tithing and giving to support Paul's ministry. If your heart is in God's work, you're tithing and, and giving. You can, Now, you can if you're like the Corinthians. They didn't support his ministry. But Paul told the Philippians, because you have done this, therefore, my God will supply all your need. And if you know you're doing that, you can stand boldly and say, God will supply all my needs. How do you know? I'm a tither. I'm a giver. Remember those three steps I gave you? Tithe, give offerings to the work of God, and then go take care of the poor. You do those three steps in that order, and you can boldly say, God's going to take care of me. God's going to meet my needs. And he will. And God will meet your needs. Any questions at this point? God will hasten his work to perform it. Isaiah chapter 55 Tithing. Number one, based on Malachi 3, tithe, the tenth, is God's. The offering is your money, but, but but God said you've not robbed me just in tithes. You've robbed me in tithes, and you've robbed me in offerings, too. So after we pay, let's say you make $100, the $10, that automatically goes to God's work. The offering is up to you. You may give 2 or $3. You may give $10. You may double it and give 10 But whatever, But that's the offering you give to God. Then number three, so tithing number one, offering number two. Number three, give to the poor. Feed the hungry. Clothe the naked. That doesn't mean when you see a guy down at Walmart like I did yesterday with the sign out that you should just give money to people on the highway because we don't know whether they're sincere or not. Uh, Isaiah 58 says, draw out your soul to the hungry. You draw out, you go find them. That way you know they're legitimate. They're not a scam. Isaiah uh, 55, maybe you found that yet? Here's what it says. Find it here real quickly. Verse 11. So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void. But it, my word, will accomplish that which I please. It, my word, will prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. God said, let the earth bring forth, and it did. Let the waters bring forth, and, and they did. Let the light be, and it was. God said, let this be, let that be. My word is going to work. My word will accomplish it. How did God make things? He made it with his word. God made things with his words. He spoke them into existence. Jesus said, now you can do that too. Two, verse, two more verses in the Old Testament. Ezekiel 13. Next book over after Lamentations. Ezekiel 13. And verse 7. Have you not seen a vain vision? <coughs> and you've spoken a lying divination? Whereas you say, the Lord saith, albeit I have not spoken. 
Don't go around saying, God said that he helps those who help themselves. Or really quote me the chapter and verse on that so I can look it up. That's a trivial thing, I know. But still, we want to say what God says, which requires you to study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. God said, you say things that I didn't say. Chapter 22 and verse 28. Ezekiel 22 and verse 28. Her prophets have dabbed them with untempered mortar, seeing vanity and divining lies unto them, saying, thus says the Lord God. Every time you say the Bible says, you are saying, thus says God. When the Lord has not spoken, find out what God said, and then just believe that. And you say, well, that's just Old Testament. Well, let's go to the New Testament then. Philippians chapter 1. Galatians, Ephesians, and then Philippians chapter 1 and verse 14. This is what the Apostle Paul wrote now. Verse 14. Many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. What word? Their words are God's. It's God's words. They're more bold to speak the word. And that's what we want to do. We want to speak God's words. You know, I won't turn there, but in Joshua 1, 8, it says we're to meditate in God's word day and night. Actually, it says meditate in God's law. And the word law, Torah, means instruction. This whole Bible is a book of Torah, a book of instruction. Meditate in God's instruction day and night. The word meditate, if I ask you what does that mean, do you think it means just to twirl it over in your mind? That's part of it. But the Hebrew word, and I can't pronounce it, it's number 1897 in Strong's Lexicon, but here's what it, what it means. It means to mutter. The difference between public speaking, like I'm doing today, and muttering is where I'm walking down the sidewalk and I'm talking to myself. Let's see, the Ten Commandments, what's number six, what's number seven? I'm walking down the street, I'm talking to myself, I'm muttering God's word. I'm saying it, I'm speaking it. One of the ways you learn something is by you speak it out. If you want to memorize a poem, you say it out loud. Or if you want to memorize scripture, I don't. I just learn it. That's better for me. But some people will take a passage and just memorize it. But how are you going to learn it or memorize it? You speak it. You speak it. You say it over and over. We did that in French class. We didn't even know what we were saying. She'd get up and say something. We'd say it after her. Didn't even know what we were saying. Then after we learned how to say it, then she'd tell us what we were saying. You know, come on, come on, tally boo. We had to say that over and over. So after a while, you get in the habit of saying those words. Well, and then you remember them. We're told here, they're bold to speak the word. Are you bold to speak God's word? Now, 1 Peter chapter 4. So this word, meditating God's law, means to matter. Start speaking God's word. One of the ways I learned the Ten Commandments, I never memorized them. When I go to work in the morning, I had my Bible laying here on the seat, and I'd read it at stoplights, you know. I'm meditating the Word day and night. Get up in the morning, don't have time to read it before I go to work, so I'd just have it on the seat there and read it. One day I left the window down, and Deuteronomy got wet. Yes, sir. I just want to make a comment. Uh -huh. Today my grandson is doing the forward, backward, and asking any number. Wow. That he could get. That's good. I How old is he? Seven. He's seven years old. Wow. For those of you who didn't hear that over the internet, his grandson's seven years old. He can can quote the Ten Commandments forwards and backwards, and some of you who are 70 can't. That's a shame. That's good. I'm glad. That's good to hear that. Here's what 1 Peter 4 says. Now, when you see the word oracle, the reason the translators translate oracle is because they were using a Greek word that later carried the connotation of a divine inspired statement. An inspired statement. If verse 11, 1 Peter 4, 11, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do as the ability that God gives, etc. If you're going to speak, you need to speak according to the oracles of God. So when you hear somebody say, this will never work, I can't make it. Wait a minute, the word says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. How are you going to get through this horrible problem? I can do all things. Yeah, but it's not possible. Well, Matthew 20, uh, 19, 26 says all things are possible with God. 
My mother, I told that my mother that one time. She said, yeah, but you're not God. And then I quoted Mark 9, 23. All things are possible to him that believes. I'm a believer. So I had her on that. She could. She didn't know how to come back. Start quoting what God says. Quote what God says. And you know, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word. The term translated word there is not logos. It's not talking about the written word. Does anybody know what the Greek word there is? Those of you who went through Greek class, y'all know what it is. It's been a while. It's been a while. No, that's not the word. <laughs> it's been a while for my feeble memory. The term there that's translated word is rhema, and it means one thing, spoken word. Faith doesn't just come by reading it. It comes by speaking it. If I want to be healed, I don't just read over and over and over and over and over and over the promises of God. I read them. Now I'm going to speak them out. By his stripes I'm healed. See what I'm doing? Because it's, faith comes by hearing. You hearing. can't hear until you speak. Speak. Yeah. Didn't say faith comes by reading. Faith comes by hearing. The rhema, the spoken word. Does that make sense? The Bible can't be read if nothing is spoken. It's a spoken, yeah. Meditate or speak in his word day and night. So you can get a certain amount of faith of coming and listening to me, but you hear me once a week. What you ought to be doing seven days a week is you ought to be hearing your own voice speaking God's word. I'm healed. The devil says, no, you're not. The Bible says I'm healed. Thank God I'm healed. You speak God's word, and you'll start to see the miraculous. And that's what we're going to need to get through the great tribulation. We're going to need the miraculous. 2 Timothy 4, does, are, are preachers exempt from this? Well, 2 Timothy 4. I wish I could preach all or, or address all the preachers in America and, and tell them what this says. Paul is writing to an evangelist, 2 Timothy 4, 2. He's writing to an evangelist, and here's what he tells him. Preach the word. Be instant. Be diligent. In season. Out of season. Well, it's just not time. I've heard this over and over from preachers. It's not time yet. It's just not. They're not ready. They're not ready yet. Well, why don't you get them ready? Why don't you get them ready? I had a graduate of this school. Got, got ordained as a pastor. And I don't want to identify him, so I won't say too much. But anyway, his church was doing what he knew was wrong. I said, well, why are you doing that? He was participating. He said, well, they haven't learned that yet. Well, what, you, what are you there for? You're supposed to be teaching them. Don't participate in it. You want to teach them. So... Preach the word. Be in, well, you know, it's not prop, it's not the time. It's not the season. No, in season, out of season. Reprove them, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, because the time will come when they won't endure sound doctrine. So it's time for the preachers to get busy and do that. Now, I want to share with you just a couple more scriptures. Matthew twelve thirty three through thirty four says that that you've got to be careful what you're saying because you're going to be held accountable for the idle words you speak. I'm just about through here, but I want to read you just about three more scriptures. Matthew 12, 33. Uh, the tree is known by his fruit. Verse 34, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And verse 35 says, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart, he brings forth. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart, he brings forth. But... 36, verse 36, but idle words, idle, idle means inoperative or inactive. Words that don't account uh, to anything, you'll give an account in the day of judgment if your words are just idle words. Well, I didn't mean it. I'm just talking. You'll give an account for that. For by your words, you'll be justified, and you'll be condemned by your words. The companion scripture for this is Luke 6, 45. Listen to this. A good man out of the good treasure his heart brings forth that which is good. An evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth that which is evil. How? For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. His mouth. The good man. Or the evil man. The good man speaks out of the abundance of his heart he'll bring forth. The evil man speaks out of the abundance of his heart he brings forth. God spoke out of the abundance of his heart and there was light. Do you see? We're to imitate God. God said he would hasten his word to perform them when you speak his words. In conclusion, I'm going to go to Psalm 91. You had no idea I was going to go there today. 
Verse 1, he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High, Jesus said, enter into your prayer closet and close the door and pray in secret, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Verse 2, I will say of the Lord, nothing works right for me. <laughs> That's not what that says. I will say of the Lord, he's my refuge. I'm not going to just think it. I'm concluding with this now, I, with this chapter here. I'm not just going to read about it or think about it. I'm going to say he's my refuge and my fortress. In him will I trust. Surely he will deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. Noisome pestilence. COVID-19. God's going to deliver me from that. He'll cover me with the shadow of, uh, with his feathers and under his wings shall you trust. His truth will be my shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid. Personalize it. I will not be afraid. See, what did we read in, in our first scripture, Hebrews 13? He has said so that we may boldly say, He has said, I will not be afraid for the terror by night. That's what he said. Actually, I'm reading it. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night. So he said it. Now, I can boldly say, I will not be afraid. Now, this is going to mean something to you when the tribulation comes. And folks, it could be here in the next few years because they're getting ready to build the temple. And you won't be afraid for the pestilence that walks in darkness or the destruction that wastes at noonday. Verse 7, a thousand will fall at your side, God said. So I can boldly say, a thousand will fall at my side. And 10,000 at your right hand. So I can boldly say 10,000 people may die at my right hand. But God said, but it shall not come nigh thee. So I can boldly say it won't come near me. Do you understand? Amen. You're not being arrogant. You're not being prideful. You're just taking God at his word. He said this. Didn't he say this? Well, then you can boldly say it. He said, only, verse 8, only with your eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. So I can boldly say it's not going to touch me. Only I'll see it on television. I'll see it with my eyes, but it ain't going to touch me. That's not arrogance. That's not pride. That's humility believing what God said. Believe what he said. <clears throat> now this is what God says to me, and he says it to you. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the most high, your habitation. I'm living in him. Christ said, you're in me and I'm in you. There shall no evil befall you, neither shall any plague come near your dwelling. When you come near your house, you can boldly say that. He'll give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Can you boldly say that? Remember I told you last week about the guy that fell out of an airplane? Yeah. It's impossible to survive that. But God gave, sent his angels. He fell in a tree outside of a hospital, and they saw him when he hit the tree, took him inside of the emergency room, and he lived to tell about it. Yes, sir. I was going to ask you, because you mentioned something about the pilot's book that the person was the sermon here today. Was that in the book when all else failed to jump out of the plane? No, they don't tell you to do that. <laughs> they don't tell you what to do if the airplane catches on fire up there. <clears throat> Somebody should add the words repeat the following our father which are in heaven. <laughs> and I'd be praying all the way down but I'd be quoting this I would be boldly saying Lord put your angels round about me lest I dash my foot against the stone I'm traveling at 120 miles per hour straight down without a parachute I'd be praying this Amen. and not only praying it but believing it he'll give his angels I'm sorry he'll give his angels charge over me personalize it no evil will befall me, neither shall any plague come near my house. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. They shall bear you up in, in their hands, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You'll tread upon the lion and the adder, serpents. The young lion and the dragon you'll trample under feet. Now here's what God says, and I'm going to conclude with this. Because he, that's you, has set his love upon me, therefore I, will I deliver him. Is Jesus in your heart? Have you abundantly accepted him? I mean, do you really love Jesus? Do you just love the doctrine? Do you just love going to church? Or do you really love Jesus? Because he set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him in trials and testing and the pestilence and the destruction that walk, that wasted at noonday. Because he's known my name, I'll set him on high. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. 
I will be with him. Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with him in trouble. Trouble's coming, folks. I want Jesus to be with me and you. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and listen to this and honor him. You know, Daniel was a, a captive when they went to Babylon. That's all he was, was a captive in chains. And God honored him because of his obedience to God. He ended up being prime minister of Babylon. Go figure. Last verse. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. I'm going to live a long, long time. I hope to live till Jesus actually returns. But if he doesn't come back, I'm going to live to be at least 100. I got a long time yet to go. I'll go shoot for 120. Well, I'll think about that. <laughs> But I do know that there are those in my family who live to be over 100, so I'm going to be at least that old. Amen. You say, you better not say that. The devil might hear you. He needs to hear me. <laughs> well, what if God hears you say, good, God is going to honor me with long life. He said, sir, right here in the word. Jesus said, you say it, you believe in your heart, you say it, you'll have it. How many of you want to live to be 100? Well, then start saying it. Some of you don't want to be okay. And think about it. <laughs> think about it. And, and uh, you say, but I got this dread disease. It doesn't matter. God can heal that. He will if you'll believe him for it. Any questions or comments? Did you get anything out of this today? Amen. Jesus put me in quarantine. 15 second delay on that. We have a delay on that. We'll give it about 10 or 15 seconds, and then we'll close up. Good to see everybody here today. That's me. They had to wait till the sermon was over. And then they... <laughs> For the people watching online that don't realize, the, our building sits about five feet from Main Street in Kannapolis. Yeah. So this is Main Street out here. Sirens and motorcycles and horns blowing. And then right behind us, we got a train. <laughs> all right, well, we're dismissed. God bless you all. Good to see everybody here. Say hello to everybody before you leave. And uh, we hope to see all of you back here next week. Take care. God bless you.